Thank you, Brendan, and thank to Mike Kelly and, and the History Department for inviting me uh, to Christendom. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, allow me to start off uh, with an on-location photo of myself taken on July 20th, 2017. I'm using the clicker for the first, there it works. So it's not exactly suitable for Vogue magazine, um, but it's a favorite. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Sound good? Um, this photo was taken by a most of the time ambulance driver, once in a while taxi driver named William. I hired him for about 80 US dollars in the small town of Bressouille in southwestern France to drive me to a hamlet in the middle of nowhere where I swore there was a castle ruin worth photographing. He thought I was crazy. Uh, he'd spent his whole life in the area and he had never heard of the castle, but he wanted my money. Uh, he also said that I was the first American he'd ever driven around in his taxi and that he was therefore glad I was crazy and just wanted to see a mythical castle uh, because he feared at first that I was there to buy half the countryside. <laughs> so, same photo, um, some others. Now my photo, therefore, is proof positive of the humble pie that William, the guy in white, had to eat. The castle is the Chateau de Glenay in the region of Poitou of France. And as I explained on the way, while William rolled his eyes, wanting to talk instead about Trump, <laughs> you, you can't escape it anywhere in the world, apparently, um, I explained to William that it was the birthplace of Marie Madeleine de Vigneron, later known as the Duchesse d'Aguillon. Uh, she was the niece and unlikely protege and heiress of the famous Machiavellian churchman, Cardinal Richelieu, who veritably ruled France for a time. And as, as I will detail in a book that I'm writing, uh, the, the Duchesse d'Aguillon, she employed her unique position for a 17th century woman to develop and expand the French church and its social, charitable, and cultural presence in remarkable ways in the Americas, Africa and Asia, not just in Europe. And her activity in this regard was so unusual that at her death, a famous French preacher said of her admiringly, unis non sufficit orbis, most campuses they would have no idea what I'm saying, but you guys, some of you know Latin, or one world was not enough for her, and that her zeal was so great that all of Christendom, the actual Christendom, not the college, uh, wasn't a big enough theater for her. But before I say more about this, uh, just FYI, William, when he thought I couldn't hear, said in French to a laborer who was there, the guy in blue there, uh, who was helping prepare the chateau for renovations, uh, William said to him, hey, uh, so you know, he said in French, hey, you, you know who lived here, right? Cardinal Richelieu's niece. She was pretty important. <laughs> the laborer turned and replied, deadpan, yeah, man, I know. I've been working here for about six months. So <laughs> people are the same everywhere. <laughs> so I have a portrait of the Duchess, or Duchess. It's a famous, not a famous painting, it's by a famous artist. It's an unfamous painting by a famous artist named Philippe de Champagne. Uh, it was painted around 1639. And it was painted in the same period that Champagne uh, uh, painted famous portraits of Richelieu himself including this one uh, on the right, which hangs at the Sorbonne in, in Paris. I will divide my talk into four parts. So first, I'll give you more background on D'Aguillon herself. Second, I'll explain how I came to be working on a book about her. Third, I'll overview aspects of what I call her missionary empire and speak to points about it that I'm still piecing together. And finally, I'll offer a few thoughts, uh, which I'm still forming, because I'm still writing the book, on what I believe is significant about D'Aguillon's story, especially what it suggests about the contributions of lay persons, especially lay women, in shaping the institutions of the Catholic Church in the early modern era, which is not uh, a, a kind of topic that is normally discussed. I, th she, I think she signifies some interesting activity that uh, a lot of us don't think about too often. So first, who was the Duchesse D'Aguillon? D'Aguillon was born in 1604 in the chateau that I just showed you. She died in 1675 in Paris, where she spent most of her life. She was the daughter of Cardinal Richelieu's sister, Françoise 
Duplessis, and the daughter also of a nobleman soldier named René de Vignerot, who served at the courts of King Henry IV and Louis XIII. Now, when Daguillon was a girl, her uncle, Richelieu, was still just a politically ambitious young bishop who, with the help of Louis XIII's mother, the Queen Regent Marie de Medici, was rising to power as a royal counselor. And during that period, Richelieu used his niece as a bargaining chip in a peace negotiation with French nobles who were resisting the Queen Mother's rule. In short, Richelieu had Marie uh, married off to a nobleman she didn't know in 1620 to help seal a peace deal. She was 16. In exchange, Richelieu was guaranteed by the groom's own powerful uncle that he would be made a cardinal of the church. Now, Marie's uh, marriage didn't last long. When she was 18, her husband, Antoine de Combalet, he died while fighting rebellious Protestants in the southeast. Men did things like that back then. <laughs> um, she decided then to go on retreat with discalced Carmelite nuns in Paris when she was a young widow. Um, and the, the Carmelites that she retreated with uh, followed the reformed rule of Teresa of Avila, who I, I have a painting of St. Teresa of Avila there. And Teresa of Avila had just been canonized at this time. So she was sort of all the rage in, in sort of uh, reforming Catholic circles, uh, um, interested in kind of uh, this kind of new spirituality that's coming out of reformed Catholic Spain. Um, now by 1624, after some time with these nuns in Paris, the young noblewoman was hoping to take permanent Carmelite vows but then her father died, and Richelieu, her uncle, asserted his authority over her as her closest male relative. Her brother, Francois, was too young to do that. So um, the closest male relative had a lot of say in, in uh, choices one made. And Richelieu, he didn't want her to be a nun. He forbade his niece from pursuing a religious vocation, and instead had her join the royal court as a lady in waiting. I'll explain who these characters are in, in a moment. This is another portrait of Marie, um, and that's, of course, Richelieu. Um, now, Richelieu hoped his niece would help his rise to power. He hoped that she would remarry with some or other important nobleman, and perhaps even with the king's eligible brother, Gaston d'Orléans. Uh, the king is, is on the bottom right. That's Louis XIII. His brother, the top right, um, if they had trashy TV in the 1620s, he would be the grand prize on The Bachelor. Um, that is, Gaston d'Orléans was, was the guy people wanted to marry. Um, and Richelieu had an idea, potentially, his niece might, might marry him and then be a member of the royal family. Now, partly because Marie de Medici, the queen mother, there in the center in the bottom, she suspected Richelieu's designs on her son but also because the young king had grown up and was competing with his mom for Richelieu's loyalty, and further because Richelieu was convinced, uh, he was convincing the king to support Protestant powers, not the Habsburg Catholic powers, in the Thirty Years' War. The cardinal and the queen mother had an epic falling out. And in 1630, Richelieu, in a bloodless coup, took over the government with the support of a weak Louis XIII, and Marie de Medici went into exile, and so this was a, a very trying time in French politics, a lot of partisans on both sides. So Richelieu was really in power, and he's essentially the, really, the, the governing force, even though the, the king officially is, is um, the ruler of everything. Now back to the portraits here of Daguillon and Richelieu. Now in the meantime, Despite Richelieu's clumsy efforts at playing matchmaker, setting his cap on his niece's behalf at various eligible bachelors, Marie Madeleine stubbornly refused to marry again. But she became indispensable to her uncle in other ways. And indeed, he came to regard her as one of the only people he truly trusted and cared for. He was a very suspicious man. He had a lot of enemies. He did not trust people easily. Um, his niece actually counseled him sometimes. She spied for him at court. 
She sometimes stayed his hand against political enemies he intended to jail and execute. Uh, she also acted informally on his behalf, meeting with clergymen, nobles, political officials, and writers and artists who sought his favors, uh, helping to decide uh, which one should benefit from Richelieu's patronage and, and her own uh, as well. And she learned from Richelieu how to become a leading member of the nobility and a patroness of all sorts of projects within France and eventually abroad. Now, to help legitimize Marie's unusually powerful role as a woman and as a non-royal, she's not a member of the royal family, uh, Richelieu, in 1638, made her a duchess in her own right, with the king's approval, of course. Um, that is, she was basically given the governing authority of a duke, even though she was not married to a duke. She was a duchess in her own right. And she was also, quite unusually, she was made a peer of France in her own right. Uh, an, another title women generally got, they, if they were a peeress, they, they would be a peer because of their husband. Uh, but she's a duchess and a peer in her own right. This is one of the highest honors French nobles could receive. And very few princely figures, nearly all of them male, enjoyed its privileges. Now, angering some of d'Aguillon's relatives, Richelieu, at his death in late 1642, bequeathed to Marie the major portion of his vast estates, goods, powers of attorney, and fortune, which was one of the largest in Europe. Now, I'd like to explain how I came to be working on uh, a project about the Duchesse d'Aguillon, and a free advertisement for my book <laughs> that you can pre-order, but don't pre-order at that price. Um, um, just wait, I shouldn't say this, but wait till Amazon has a lower price if anyone's interested. This is my book, Apostles of Empire, the Jesuits in New France, which is coming out from University of Nebraska Press uh, uh, very soon. Now, I first learned of the Duchesse d'Aguillon, Duchesse d'Aguillon, pardon me, uh, early in the research phase for my first book. And my first book is about Jesuit missionaries in colonial North America. It's, a, an, it's an account of a mission that is best known as that of the eight sainted North American martyrs, including Isaac Jogues and Jean de Brebeuf, who died during the Iroquois Wars of the 1640s. As my book points out, uh, however, there were over 300 other Jesuits in this mission, most of whom did not die as martyrs, and there were many other people too, French and Native American alike, who played vital roles advancing the mission with the Jesuits. And so one goal of my book, as a scholarly book, is to clarify ways that the Jesuit missions among the Hurons, the Iroquois, and other indigenous peoples in 17th and 18th century America were not strictly clerical ventures, but collaborative efforts with lay elites in France, French colonial and indigenous leaders in Eastern Canada, New England, the Great Lakes region, and Louisiana, and also women religious, such as the Ursulines and Augustinians of Quebec. Now, Daguillon's name kept jumping out from the Jesuit mission sources, especially the Jesuits' famous uh, Relations de la Nouvelle France, or Jesuit Relations, which were annual books published in Paris with stories about their missionary work in North America. And her name, the Duchess's name, uh, kept jumping out, especially in connection to a charitable hospital that she founded in Quebec from Paris. She never left France. Uh, she founded a charitable hospital in Quebec, and she staffed it with Augustinian canonesses who were trained in medical care. D'Aguillon had been inspired to do this, uh, as still as a quite young woman, uh, by the Jesuits' calls in their early relation to French women to become involved in spreading Catholicism and alleviating disease and poverty in North America. She began to develop the hospital project in 1636. And it was the first of its kind in North America. It was devoted to free medical care and end of life care too, for Native Americans who needed it, many of whom horribly were suffering from smallpox, which had been brought to the New World during the Iberian conquests. D'Aguillon named the hospital the Hôtel Dieu de Précieux Sang, or Charitable Hospital of the Precious Blood. She had a, a personal strong devotion to the blood of Christ. Now eventually growing into a large institution, the hospital, that's I, I think a early 19th century drawing it, so it was a lot smaller in the 17th century. Uh, the hospital actually grew into a very large institution over time, and it's been in continuous operation up until our own time but its Augustinian affiliation ended in 1962. 
So Daguillon, she factors into my first book, in short, as a major lay metropolitan elite collaborator with the Jesuits. She employed her clout in Paris, not only to help develop sister ministries to theirs in the mission setting, but also to help fundraise for Jesuit projects in North America and ensure that overseas missionaries and the French colonial effort generally in America didn't fall off the radar screen of her uncle's administration or that of his successors. She was in regular communication with the Augustinian women as well as the Jesuits in Quebec, uh, directing them at times on ways her resources were to be used and innovating with them on how to adapt the norms of social charity as she knew them, which were largely urban focused. Most institutions like a charitable hospital tended to be urban institutions in France, but she wanted to adapt these to a colonial setting where you have very few and, and far between settlements and in many ways a wilderness setting. So they're, they're kind of adapting social charity to this new context. Now Daguillon also served the purpose while I was writing and revising my first book of making me more attentive to other lay women on both sides of the Atlantic and French and Native American uh, alike whose stories, especially their contributions to this neglected social charity dimension of the Jesuits enterprise are important for assessing the mission, I think in a well-rounded historical way. So putting stories like the martyrdoms in a larger context of, of uh, other things the mission was also about. However, as I was piecing together Daguillon's story as it related to the Jesuits, I discovered that I was barely scratching the surface of what was a most unusual amount of activity for a non-head of state layperson and a laywoman, no less, on behalf of Catholic missions abroad, and not just in North America, but also in North Africa, Madagascar, Southeast Asia, and the Middle East. And much of this activity I began to realize as I occasionally looked into other sources when I was supposed to be working on the other book, uh, was surprisingly enterprising on her part. Uh, there was two-way inspiration, but very, very often it seemed like she was the one inspiring, not being inspired by the priests and religious involved in these missions. She was kind of spurring people on to, to projects abroad. Now, for example, uh, Daguillon, was largely responsible for expanding her good friend St. Vincent de Paul's priestly and charitable society, the Congregation of the Mission, or the Lazarists, also known as the Vincentians, into Tunisia and Algeria in the 1640s, when those places were part of the Ottoman Empire. De Paul took direction from her on how his missionaries stationed in North Africa, some of them engaged in hospital work, were to conduct themselves as agents of both the church and of France. Now, this is not something you'll learn from most biographies of de Paul, uh, written by authors who have largely kind of dismissed Daguillon as a rich widow who simply uh, was inspired by the saint's charisma and who passively underwrote projects that, according to the narrative, must have been primarily the fruit of the zeal and creativity of clergymen and religious. And I'll, I'll come back to this context a bit later. While still writing my first book, I started a file on Daguillon, which kept growing. And soon I grew convinced that she was an important post-Tridentine Catholic leader in her own right, deserving to be brought out from the shadows of the famous churchmen that she knew. And I realized she was very famous in her own time. She was well known, but I, I think because her uncle is one of the most famous men in European history. And one of her close friends is one of the most famous French saints ever. She kind of got lost in the shuffle a bit. And I became especially convinced uh, that some work needed to be done on her story after learning that only one serious book had ever been written about her. Back in 1879, so a while ago, um, by a, an aristocratic Frenchman, Alfred Bonneau Avenant, who when you read the book in French, it's very, um, he, he loves the Duchess. Everything she does is beautiful, and he kind of, um, he, it seems like he was trying to get her cause going for sainthood. And so he sometimes, um, I, I could tell immediately as a historian, some of the ways he uses the sources are not always that reliable. And he did not have, frankly, access to as many sources as a modern scholar has with all the digital resources as well as the jet setting opportunities to go to different archives. So, um, so um, his book, I think, needs to be updated. <laughs> 
and it, uh, preferably in English, so, so you guys can read it. Um, and I decided, after realizing that this book needed to be written, that I should be the one to write it. And happily, I've, I've finished most of the research, and I'm now actively writing the manuscript. So now to really my main theme, which is Daguillon's missionary empire, as I'm calling it. Uh, and, and I'll tell you about some aspects of it that I'm still investigating. So I made this, one of the first maps I ever made. I was rather proud of this slide. Um, it's really hard to make the perfect circles on my, my uh, program anyway, but it, it happened. Okay, so my second book is a biography of Daguillon. So it, it covers many aspects of her life. But at its heart, one of the driving kind of themes of the book is the development of what I call her Catholic empire, of Catholic ministries and institutions that she helped develop and in, in many cases uh, oversaw in informal ways um, throughout her life. Now her domestic French and larger European empire in this regard was remarkable in its own right and I, I will deal with it in my book. But I want to highlight in this talk today what I, what I call her missionary empire so to speak. Now I'm using the term empire very loosely here. I'm using it sort of like the way you talk about a, a CEO's business empire. Um, so the French colonial empire, I should clarify, of the time was quite small and new compared to Spain's and Portugal's. And most places in which Daguillon got involved were not actually under any sort of French control colonially, even though interestingly, uh, many, many of these places did become part of, of modern France's empire in modern times, and the, the Third Republic, the era of the Third Republic. So let me explain just a few details uh, about each global context, one by one, and I'll speak in this order, North Africa, Southeast Asia, Madagascar, the Middle East, and then I'll come back again to North America. So first, uh, Daguillon's North African projects. D'Aguillon's expansion of St. Vincent de Paul's Lazarus Congregation into North Africa is quite interesting, in my opinion, because of the, uh, the political mechanisms that she employed to, accomplishment, to accomplish it. Now, specifically, she took advantage of the ancien regime's system of what was called the venalité des offices, or the purchasing of offices from the crown or from previous holders, and then paying an annual tax to the crown for the privilege of exercising power through them. So there was kind of open sale of political offices. It's partly how the French state worked at this time. And um, so a noble could actually have kind of public political power if they guaranteed they would sort of uh, pay a tax to the king. And you could sell the office if you just got tired of dealing with it. You could sell it to someone, usually someone in your own network that you trusted, and then they would, they would have to do the same. Um, so she essentially, she actually purchased the French consulates, the ambassadorial offices, the consulates in Tunis and Algiers, two cities in the North, in the North African coast, coastal area of the Ottoman Empire in the mid-1640s. She literally bought the offices of, of French consuls in, in those cities and then staffed them with Lazarus priests of her choice. This was not normal to put priests in consular offices, uh, but she could do it because she was Richelieu's niece. Um, and she was comfortable with the idea of political churchmen because she was raised essentially by, by Richelieu himself uh, from the age of uh, about 19 onward. Um, now, um, because uh, th these priests, they're in consular offices, she essentially turned the secular diplomatic mission of these offices Normally, their, their business was to facilitate trade with the Ottoman Empire, to negotiate secular matters, such as the release of, of captives. Uh, there were a lot of people taken into slavery in, in North Africa, many Frenchmen included. Um, so those were the normal things that the consuls dealt with. And she turned the offices into dually secular and apostolic French Catholic sort of mission offices. Uh, because of Daguillon's proprietary relationship to the French consulates in North Africa for many years, she exerted a kind of executive power, a certain authority over these uh, office holders and over the Lazarist missionaries stationed in Tunis and Algiers, and she directed them through communications and with her purse strings. Now, although he did not always like it 
St. Vincent de Paul deferred to D'Aguillon when she urged the Lazarus to facilitate French mercantile and political interests in the region, while also tending spiritually and charitably, uh, including via a new hospital in Algiers, to enslaved Christians and quietly also to some local Muslims. So some of the letters I've seen of Vincent de Paul to the Duchess or Vincent de Paul writing to his priests uh, in North Africa, sometimes he doesn't always like what they have to do this sort of dually secular and, and religious uh, project, but, but very often he says, the Duchess wants it this way. So, so she has a certain authority over uh, Vincent de Paul. Now during um, this period that those consular offices where a mission was getting going in North Africa, um, in the year 1653, D'Aguillon, uh, and several other influential French lay elites and churchmen also were approached in Paris by a Jesuit from Avignon named Alexandre de Rhodes, and I'll just call him Rhodes because it sounds better to me as an American. So Rhodes had spent a number of years as a missionary in Vietnam. And Rhodes had worked alongside Portuguese priests primarily, but he was dissatisfied with the political problems that his association with Portugal was causing among the governing authorities in several Vietnamese kingdoms. Vietnam was not a, a unified uh, state. There were multiple kingdoms. And the Portuguese presence, the association of the Catholic priests which, with the Portuguese was causing problems um, to the Christian mission. So with the reluctant tacit approval of the Pope and the relatively new Congregation de Propaganda Fide in Rome, uh, the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith. Uh, this is the ancestor of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Um, uh, the, the Propaganda Fide was attempting to bring royally sponsored world missions under Vatican supervision. They were trying to centralize Vatican control over missions, far-flung missions that were, that were sponsored by the crowns of Europe. Um, so with the reluctant tacit approval of the Pope and the officials at Propaganda Fide, Rhodes, this Jesuit, in a kind of freelancing way, was attempting to stir up French elite interests in establishing new French-supported but Vatican-approved bishoprics in Southeast Asia to kind of liberate his mission from the Portuguese and instead have the French involved. And so his hope was that they could build Catholic missions in the region, independently of Portugal, with a mix of French and also new hoped-for indigenous clergy drawn from the growing numbers of Catholic converts in and nearby the Vietnamese kingdoms. Now after Rhodes was ordered unexpectedly by his Jesuit provincial to pursue a new mission in Persia, not to return to Vietnam, because he was sort of bummed out by that. He had to learn a whole new foreign language and, and <laughs> go off to Persia while the Duchess and other churchmen were still focused on Vietnam and Paris. The Duchess, uh, took up his cause in Paris. She kind of started to spearhead this idea of French missionary bishoprics for Southeast Asia. And so with Rhodes out of the picture, Daguillon started pushing the idea of French bishoprics for Southeast Asia for several years, despite setbacks in negotiations with Rome at different levels. And in 1657, for example, she commissioned a young priest named Francois Palou. Uh, this is Palou here. Um, he had very much impressed her with his manners, his erudition, his piety, his very, his very deep faith, but he was a young priest, not from a, the highest born family, so he needed a patroness like her to get him noticed. She commissioned him to go to Rome and to talk up the project of these French bishoprics for Southeast Asia. She also communicated to the newly elected Pope, Alexander uh, VII on the right, that she was personally willing to cover the expenses of at least one of the new bishoprics, a missionary diocese essentially, if he were to approve the consecration of Palu himself um, and several other Frenchmen that she and her friends put forward as candidates um, as bishops. And another of these was a, a man named Pierre Lambert de la Matte. Uh, he was also chosen as a possible new bishop uh, for Southeast Asia. And this worked, so the, the, the Duchess sort of pressure campaign, she got the Vatican to approve this idea. And so for the first time, not just the Spanish and the Portuguese, but the French would have overseas bishops. Um, 
And so by the end of 1658, Palu was named Apostolic Vicar or Missionary Bishop for Tonkin in Vietnam. And Lambert de la Motte was also made a bishop. Now the two would eventually travel onward to Southeast Asia, but due to political challenges in the region, they would end up establishing missions headquartered in Siam, not Vietnam. Now with these men, uh, other churchmen too in Paris, and other wealthy elites, whom the Duchess often would gather in her palatial home for planning meetings, that's not her home actually, I'll, I'll explain what that is. Um, D'Aguillon would help establish, by 1663, a new French seminary, that's what that building is, dedicated to training clergymen for overseas missionary assignments. And this was the Seminaire des Missions Étrangères de Paris, or the MEP Seminary, as it's usually known in shorthand. And the MEP Seminary, a sort of missionary seminary, is still very active today. It, it still trains clergy today in Paris. And the MEP Seminary is probably most famous for some of its later very French nationalist spirited missions into Vietnam and other parts of the world in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Uh, so France was a secular empire at that point, but there was a lot of Catholic missionary activity done under the aegis of the Third Republic. So it's most famous for that, but its founding era is tied, its founding is tied to the story of the Duchess. Now as the most generous supporter of the MEP's early projects, uh, D'Aguillon would use her influence in Rome to negotiate with Propaganda Fide on the new bishop's behalf. She also regularly communicated with the MEP seminary's directors as its missions expanded into other parts of the world. And she corresponded regularly with Bishop Palou, who regarded her as, as a patroness, just, just as she regarded him as a protege. Uh, and, and Bishop Palou, when he was traveling abroad, he would send to her King Louis XIV and the Archbishop of Paris, very similar reports. So it kind of shows her, her status in his mind. Uh, he's reporting very similar things to the Duchess that he is to the, uh, the King and the Archbishop of Paris. Um, and among uh, things he would report to her uh, were just updates about his and his confrères' missionary labors. He would also talk about French, Portuguese, and Dutch commercial and diplomatic activity in and near Indochina. And also he would report time and time again, he was annoyed by this, about Portuguese Jesuit squabbles with the French. Uh, the, the Portuguese Jesuits were a constant thorn in the MEP missionary's side in the region. Now as D'Aguillon and her associates were still negotiating with Rome in the mid 1650s to get the Southeast Asian mission up and running for the French church, the Duchess also advanced the Lazarus missionary expansion in Africa but in Madagascar, off mainland Africa's southeastern coast, very far away from Ottoman Tunis and Algiers. Now Madagascar, which had an ethnically and religiously diverse population, there were Muslims, Jews, and native uh, indigenous Malagasy uh, uh, practitioners. It was a religiously diverse context. Um, Madagascar was the scene, by this point, of early French commercial activities and some planned French efforts to colonize and significantly, D'Aguillon's uncle, Cardinal Richelieu, had backed a French merchant company in Madagascar much earlier. But by the mid-1650s, that merchant company was failing, and D'Aguillon's powerful cousin, uh, a duke named the Duke de Melaray, um, he was replacing the old one with his own. And in the meantime, with D'Aguillon's encouragement, the Lazarists had begun a mission uh, at Fort Dauphin, which was the French trading settlement. And the Duchess was directing the Lazarus priest to, to work exclusively with her cousin's merchant company, not with the old company. And the mission, however, it faced very serious challenges compared to some of the other missions she supported. A lot of the missionaries died from illnesses and it, it, it struggled a great deal and it did not last that long. And it eventually had to shut down. Uh, but not until after D'Aguillon had her protege, Bishop Palou, visit the mission he did a lot of sailing all over the world. Uh, he assessed what might be done on its behalf to keep it in operation. And D'Aguillon, even at the time this mission was failing, she somehow was hoping that from Madagascar, the French could launch new missions into other islands in the, in the Southern Indian Ocean and into the strange new rumored land 
that the French knew as les terres australes, or the, the Australian lands. Uh, there, there was not much knowledge of that continent, uh, but the Duchess was already envisioning French activity, missionary activity there. Uh, the Pope said no to that. Um, he said, we're not going to send missionary bishops to a potentially imaginary place. Um, now, one final context, and I promise I will be wrapping this up very soon. Um, now, Daguillon also advanced Roman Catholicism in Ottoman-controlled Syria, and eventually also the region around Baghdad, which was then in a contested borderland of the Ottomans' extensive empire. And her activity in this regard, a bit differently, was focused very much around one figure, uh, a clerical protege of hers, another sort of priest she kind of plucked up from obscurity and made into sort of a great, greater man. Uh, this is Francois Piquet, whose talents and promise for a career first in diplomatic service and then as a churchman, she discerned when he was still quite young. Now, due to Daguillon's intercessions at the French court, uh, Piquet was appointed as French consul to Aleppo in Syria in 1652, and he was a layman at this time. Uh, and in this post, though, with Daguillon's support and her long-distance kind of supervision from Paris, he energetically served French interests, but also promoted the unification of the local Jacobite church and the Maronite church, the latter of which was in communion with Rome. So she wanted the Christians in the region to be brought into communion with Rome. And so Piquet was working on this as French consul. Piquet also worked with the Vatican to build up the presence in Syria of discalced Carmelites from France, her favorite order, the Carmelites. Um, now eventually, Piquet himself discerned a belated call to the priesthood. So he stepped down from his consular office and he returned to France, where Daguillon was very pleased to support his career in the church with her patronage. And after he completed his studies and his priestly formation, and had served in ordained ministry in France for a few years. He eventually returned to the Levant as an MEP-sponsored French missionary, as a, actually as a French bishop for Babylon, or Baghdad, where he would eventually also serve jointly as the French ambassador to Persia. It's kind of a theme. Uh, she had all these churchmen kind of dually serving as missionaries and, um, and in consular or ambassadorial positions. Now, in the meantime, Daguillon, while he was training for the priesthood, had been in contact with Capuchin, Jesuit, and other missionaries in and around Syria, financially assisting them and raising more lay elite awareness of their various projects. Now, I said I would come back to the missions uh, in North America um, that Daguillon facilitated. I'm still piecing together parts of this story, so I don't want to say too much more about this, um, and I want to make sure I get to the end of my remarks faster than this is going here. Um, I should mention that the first bishop of Quebec, first French bishop of Quebec, was also an MEP bishop. He knew Daguillon. Um, he was authorized to become a bishop in North America around the same time that Palou and others were being uh, chosen in Rome uh, with Daguillon's support. Um, there was a small-scale MEP mission that, that grew up in, in uh, Quebec, eventually also in Louisiana after her time. Uh, but she also continued to support the Augustinian women uh, in Quebec. And there were other missionaries. The Sulpicians uh, began a mission in Quebec as well. And once again, there's a connection to Daguillon, the founder of the Société de Saint-Sulpice in Paris. I just happened to be another churchman very close to her at her parish church of Saint-Sulpice in Paris. And um, so she has some connection with the Sulpician mission, but I'm still trying to figure out what that was. It's not a sort of public, her, her connection to that. Um, and just after I finished this talk, I've been coming across connections of the Duchess to French attempts at mission, missions in South America as well. So it's really all over the place. And I'm, I'm still trying to stitch together parts of her story. Um, now, one more Canadian connection uh, of Daguillon I would be remiss not mentioning is that there's actually Duchesse Daguillon beer uh, that's sold at a, a dépanneur in Quebec that markets its own label. There's a little place you can buy beer called La Duchesse d'Aguillon. That's so most young people in Canada, if they've ever heard her name, it's, it has to do with that. Now that's a pretty great legacy, I think, to have beers named after you four centuries after you lived. Um, but um, I'm going to close my remarks, saying some things instead. 
about what I believe Daguignon's story has to teach us on the subject of lay women's contributions to the early modern church. So I'll come back to my, my map that I'm so proud of here. Um, now the Duchess's story is historically significant on a number of fronts, um, in my view. That's actually her home in Paris, which the current president of the Senate of, of, of the French Republic lives in that house. You can't actually go on tours inside. I'm hoping that once, if I become a famous enough historian, they'll let me in the building and I can, I can snap some photos, but not, not yet. Um, so I, I'm just one of these people lurking outside. Um, <laughs> and the, the guards are like, what, what are you doing? Get your camera away. Um, now the Duchess, her story is, is uh, historically significant on a number of fronts. Now where church history is concerned, she appears to have been a central actor, not just a passive underwriter of missionary ventures, during a key period of the Vatican's evolving relationships, both with increasingly assertive national monarchically governed churches of the post-Tridentine period, the period after the Council of Trent, and also with a rapidly expanding missionary churches that were being established around the globe in an era of intensifying European and colonial and mercantile activity and competition. Now more specifically, she appears to have been a central actor in the Vatican's reluctant but pragmatic endorsement of new French Catholic missionary ventures that were de facto, if not always de jure, under the, the control of the expanding French monarchical state and also under the control of collaborators with the French nation state, including Daguignon herself. Now this was a pragma pragmatic turn the Vatican was making. They were trying to break up the Iberian, the Spanish and Portuguese missionary monopoly, so to speak, around the world. So in order to kind of encourage long-term Vatican control of more missions, they thought if they allow the French to kind of break into this, it might be easier for them to kind of uh, exert a bit more control on, on missionary activity around the world. Now Daguillon, very much her, her uncle Richelieu's niece in this regard, she deftly negotiated, usually in very informal ways, in her living room, through letters, through agents, um, sometimes while hosting dignitaries at big grand parties at her country estates. Um, she negotiated with church and state officials on behalf not just of her mission projects, but also on behalf of the French church in particular, the French church's expansion and a French interest generally in various parts of the world. And I also just want to say here that there are two shorthand historical narratives out there. One of them mostly among scholars of Christian missionary activity over the long term, and one of them in Catholic discourses in contemporary times, especially since the promulgation of the Second Vatican Council, which I think Daguignon's story challenges in some ways. Now the first of these a narrative that is sort of common to scholars who study missions, uh, historians who study missionary activity over the long term. There's a narrative that's sort of dominant that enterprising lay activity with respect to Christian evangelization primarily originated in the 18th century among Protestants, especially pietistic Lutherans and British evangelicals in the Anglican Communion. Now what I'm still learning about Daguillon, other Catholic laypersons of her time in different ways, calls that narrative into question a bit. I believe that one reason much of this lay activity has been downplayed or even invisible to some extent um, to scholars of, of various persuasions who study the history of missions is that for a long time most of the historical work on overseas Catholic missions was done by in-house historians, so to speak, usually clergymen and religious who are part of the same order or institution of the mission that they're studying. So that you'd have Jesuit historians looking at Jesuit missions, you'd have an MEP priest being the scholar for MEP missions, and quite naturally they, they would focus on members of their same order or institution, their activities. And a lot of the lay people involved were kind of, uh, sort of depicted as sort of more marginal to the story. Um, but that has changed considerably recently as more work is being done on the history of Catholicism per se by a wider range of scholars, including ones like myself, who are focused on religious orders like the Jesuits, but who are Catholic laypersons. Now scholars like myself uh, approach their subjects from a lay perspective. We're interested in ways that missionaries and others were part of larger 
ecclesial pictures, so to speak, parts of networks that were, like the church herself, largely lay in membership. <coughs> and while I don't put too much stock in the identity politicking that dominates uh, academic discourses so much today, it's also simply likelier that a lay woman historian of Catholicism, while examining the source records of, of say, the Jesuit mission in New France, is going to notice more readily and have greater natural curiosity about figures such as Marie de Vigneron when she keeps stumbling across them. Now, a second narrative that I think needs some adjusting in light of Daguillon's story is that it is only really since the Second Vatican Council, only beginning in the mid 20th century, when the council taught the Catholic laity in this vein, that lay persons, elite and otherwise, including women, realize that they have an important and indeed apostolic and evangelistic role to play in the life of the church as she engages with diverse peoples and cultures of the world. Now, my work suggests a bit differently that the new emphasis in official church statements, especially issuing from the Vatican in, in modern times on the lay apostolate, um, helps contemporary scholars like myself who look at the history of Catholicism look back on the more distant past through a lens that enables us to see with sharper vision all the apostolic lay activity that was already going on back then too. It just wasn't being discussed in quite the same ways. Now as it happens, looking back on Daguillon's 17th century through such a lens, I have come across many strong statements by churchmen of her time who regarded her as a leaderly inspirational lay Catholic figure. Now, priests described her in terms such as une femme héroïque, a heroic woman. Some described her as a second Saint Paul in the 17th century. Um, one even described her as a woman who was priestly, sacerdotal in French, in her zeal for growing the French church. He was not a supporter of women's ordination. <laughs> he, he was speaking about, the, I think, the priesthood of, of, of all Christians. Um, the Jesuit Rhodes had said of her, that even as she resided in Paris, she made apostolic people go from one to the other um, pole of, of the earth. Uh, and quote, she brought daylight at one and the same time to China in the east and Canada in the west. One preacher, Jacques Charles de Brissassier, strikingly described her home as quote, less like the hall of a lady of quality than it's like the, bishop, uh, the palace of a bishop given the continual flowing in and out of ecclesiastics and of religious of all orders who come from all over to blend together there. And even Pope Alexander VII, in a formal brief that he issued in September of 1658, acknowledged in strong terms her reputation for leadership when it came to launching and sustaining apostolic missions. Now finally, Daguillon's story, as I will tell it, may also have something to teach us about the organizing and even occasionally the disciplining, informal disciplining power within and for the church that at least some devout laypersons, including occasionally women, used to have compared to what is possible today. Now, I hope you find Daguillon's story to be somewhat interesting and, and one that has sparked at least a few questions. So thank you, and I look forward now to some questions. Thank you.